So I left you guys with some some fairly vague squam work. I said something along the lines of uh, 80s cartoon in a realistic style and then, I don't know, figure out, like, do a study of composition or something. And I, I apologize that that was, that was vague. So this week I figured we'd, we'd talk about composition a little bit rather than um, leave you totally hanging. Um, we're so gonna... Now you're jumping the gun and you're trying to avoid J-Doodle again, Steve. That's that's what that's what I do. That's another hallmark of sketch and scotch. Is I try and just rush right past that. You're a tease, J Doodle. What we do is we give you a idea to draw. Steve has five or ten minutes to draw it. The rest of you have the whole show to draw it, and you will be entered into a little raffle to win a gently loved print. Steve, you ready for this? All okay. Right, Steve, it is a Lovecraftian version of a children's toy. <laughs> Of crafty in children's toy. Yes, and so you could take a base children's toy like a Mr. Potato Head or a My Little Pony or I don't know. What was your favorite children's toy as a as a kid, Steve? Mountain Dew. That was not. We're such a liar. Scott, I like my chemistry was... set. I had a little chemistry set, and I set a lot of things on fire. See, you could do a lot of crafty in chemistry set. Janet said that Steve's toy as a child was crayons. Surprisingly. My weapon as a child was crayons. Yeah, your parents' house never survived. I ruined so many things. My parents were really smart, though. So, um, I actually, I didn't really ruin many things, um, not with crayons. I ruined them with the chemistry set, but what happened was the first time I, I destroyed a legitimately uh, expensive thing with with paint and crayons, it was my mom had bought a new dresser and it was bright white and brilliant and just, just neat. And I thought- Saved up to buy it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I bet, I bet my mom would like a nice drawing on it. She likes my drawings. And so I drew all over it. Like every color I had, I completely just, just ruined the thing. and. If I were, like, I, I don't know how they managed to have the patience to not have just murdered me, but what happened was my, my mom said, oh, these are, this is so great, you've colored it, you've, oh, this is so great. You know what, there, there's just one thing that kind of makes me sad. I, I want to show all of my friends what all of your great artwork, but it's on this dresser. I can't, like, take that to work with me. I wish you'd draw on paper, because then I can show people. And that yeah. stuck with me, right? I was like, paper, yeah, uh, duh, no wonder. That's why people draw on paper, is because then you can take it places and show people, oh, okay, I get it. And like- Still hasn't learned, he drew it painted on copper last week. <laughs> I, I did. Um, and by the way, uh, to follow up on uh, Steve's story about the beautiful white dresser he drew all over, his mom still has it, and it still has the drawings on the side <laughs> of it. Is that right. my, my time's up? Your time is up. So yours was just, just a insane ba baby playing with a, a... It's baby's first eldritch portal. Oh gosh. <laughs> It was going to be an elder sign, but um, there's too many tentacles to make it look like an elder sign, so. Rossius said, I'm a lick it. <laughs> the, the squam work that I gave you in that last little, little bit of, uh, of robot voice that Drew was nice enough to pass along for me was uh, do an 80s cartoon in a realistic style. So I thought, this time I will go ahead and do kind of a, a review, demonstration, whatever, on composition and how to compose things. The quick clarification that you guys did get was, like, think of it like a movie poster. And so I decided I'd just, I'd do exactly that. I did a Thundercats movie poster. Back in the day, uh, a lot of the big hits were done by all kind of the same artists. A awesome, awesome fella by the name right. of Drew Struzan. Stole your thunder, but I couldn't right? help it. So this is Drew Struzan. Uh, you may not have seen his work. 
<laughs> you, you, <laughs> you have. <laughs> and the way he composes his movie posters is almost like a visual montage. I don't want to say collage. It's not like a collage. It's more like um, he uses it as a narrative. And so, like, for example, here, he's trying to show you a little bit of the story inside. So he's got your protagonist, great big front and center, antagonist, supporting characters, setting, um, and then a couple of scenes, and everything goes in a swoosh, right? Got a lovely little... Reads nice. Lovely little swoosh. And we love swooshes. Yes, we do. And then, of course, to separate the good guy and the bad guy, you have, you have the hook, right? The name of the movie, the hook. Well, hook. Um, separates and shows... <laughs> totally different movie between the hook and hook. <laughs> And so there's a lot of things going on that you don't really feel like you don't you don't say to yourself, ah, okay, so the hook here is symbolic of the conflict between Pan and Hook. You just go, that's that's cool. Like this is just cool. You, a lot of composition is very subtle. It's something that you don't you don't put your finger on. You just know it kind of works for you. It looks good. It looks cool. It kind of feels like in this case, the movie, or it portrays the emotion you're going for, or just, like, composition is, is subtle, and that's what makes it difficult, because while there are, there are tools, I don't want to say rules, because there's, art doesn't really have rules, let's, let's be honest. Uh, no, there are <laughs> rules, because you need to have, have some sort of uniformity, and, and there's, order to chaos, because then in order to get chaos, you can break those rules to make... <laughs> if there weren't rules, we'd have nothing to break. <laughs> True enough. But there's there's a kind of a toolbox you can pull out to help you get where you're going. Um, here's another Drew Strews and Peace, the Shawshank Redemption. And you'll see that he has th this motif go on a lot. He has major characters being huge in frame, right? Right here, we've got an iconic scene from the movie, which is the is it's cathartic. It's it's super important, and and again again you've got this separation. This time you don't really need it because they're they're friends. You've got the antagonists on one side, the protagonist big front and center, and then supporting protagon or supporting uh, good guys on one side. So he's he's balancing everything out, uh, and he's creating these narrative montages. Uh, a lot of Drew Struzan's work is is this way, where he's kind of trying to montage the movie for you. Montage! And include uh, supporting cast, a lot of characters, and for these two examples, they're fairly simple uh, compositional, like, like this here, it's a good old, it's just a wreath, right? There's a circle, and another circle. Right? Everything is, is just lined up and it's, it's simple, but it's strong. It works. Uh, this is a completely different way of approaching composition. Another amazing artist. This is Donato Giancola. And he's going for more of a, this is more about cropping and, and proportion. Uh, and by that, I mean what gets space and importance in the frame rather than how long should arms and legs be. Everything is is cropped in really tight, right? Uh, you see some eyes, but most of the face is covered. This is a big, big element right here, this book. We don't know what it is, but it's important. It's burning, she's cradling it. So this composition is all about this intimate, mystery, right? We don't know what this is, but it it's important. And you um, want to know what it is. You've got you've got the the hands that are they're digging into it. Look at like how this book means something. He's using composition to strengthen this narrative um, by bringing you in very close. She's covered in soot, but she's nude as far as we can tell. So 
that is another layer of intimacy. It's not just, oh, he's done a good job of painting a book and a girl holding it. The composition is what makes this work. It's the way he has framed things. It's where he's put the importance. And that's what composition is about, is where do you put things? Why do you put things in certain places? And uh, how do you achieve an effect that you're and, going and for? Part of it's this is a different thing. This is pulled way back. Um, it's just a casual moment between Gandalf and Bilbo. And this has some more subtle compositional elements in it. When you look at this, you feel like this is kind of peaceful and inviting, and you kind of feel like you want to know what they're talking about, and you don't feel like you're invading at all. You kind of feel welcome. And what he's done to make you feel welcome is you've got, you've got these meandering paths coming from the bottom as though this is a path for the viewer, right? You are introduced gently and casual, casually to the focal point. You move and it's, you've got these gentle slopes, you've got these nice circles and circles tend to be gentle and calming, the curves in, in general, that's not a hard fast rule. There are not a lot of hard fast rules, but because we're back and we're invited in via this path, that gives you this sense of, oh, this is, this is a nice uh, calm scene that I can be a part of. Moving on, uh, Brahm. Brahm is another guy. He's just amazing at everything he does. Um, and part of, part of what I'm gonna show you is that you can do composition with lots of figures. You can do composition with one figure. You can do composition with no figures. So this one is a little bit about um, repeating shapes to bring you to a focal point and to make the whole thing feel uh, tied together. Uh, so you've got you've got the wings and they have this this nice little curve, which is echoed in the shield, which is echoed in her her gesture. You've got this whole arcing thing. You've got these guys kind of um, deflect, like they're, they're kind of reflecting the viewer back up. And so all of these things are basically ripples to bring you to the focal point. There's all kinds of stuff going on. He, he's, you, um, I'm just talking about shape elements at this point, but he's also using um, light and dark. You know, the face has the darkest darks and the lightest lights. She's this bright color, or somewhat colorful um, element surrounded by black, surrounded by a light again. And so these things create these rhythmic elements that pull you in and make everything feel like it's in the right place. A lot of art is not getting a picture in your head and then putting it down on paper. Art is making decisions and then deciding uh, if those were good decisions, moving on, or or revisiting things. You there's a lot of reworking. There was um, I saw a thing. It's kind of been going around, so you may have seen it too. Where um, Dan Harmon, who did Rick and Morty, said, "You know what? Don't try and make a good thing. Just because you won't. You can't. It's just just not how it works. Don't try and make an awesome thing, because." You'll make a thing and it'll suck and you'll quit and you'll hate it. Just accept that it's, it's going to suck. Make a thing that sucks. Just make a thing that sucks. And you know what? Then fix it. That's how we do it. You make a thing and you fix the things that are broken about it. And eventually, you have a good thing. And I feel that way a lot about my, my art in that I don't have a picture in my head. And I, I, if you've seen, I often do... 10 to 20 sketches before I decide to move on with one. I will fiddle around with with light and texture and composition and all that stuff forever because I want to get it right and I rarely get it right the first time. I really don't. This is Wayne Reynolds. Yeah, they were already yelling about it in the <laughs> chat actually. He's amazing. Yep, of course. And his is just waynereynolds.com. <laughs> not Wayne not Wayne Reynolds art, but waynereynolds.com. Uh, a lot of Wayne's composition is these these great swoopy things, right? 
just brings you right in the center. It doesn't matter where you enter the page from with your eye. It goes, yeah, you're going this way. Oh, I'm going to come in from, oh, you're going this way. Ah, oh, just this way. It's just this, this spiral that you can't help but find your way to what you want to look at. And what you want to look at is you've got this connection between uh, an apparently very clever dragon who is watching the adventurers or maybe casting a spell on them through the crystal ball. I don't know. But you know that uh, that's what's going on. So this is Marko Djurjevic. I hope I pronounced that name right. I've met him, I wasn't paying enough attention. I don't think he actually said his name for me. Not a common name. Okay, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Marco's nice, he's awesome. Yeah, we, we got to hang out with him a little bit at uh, Luca this year. Yeah, he's super nice. Yeah. He's known for his uh, like Marvel character redesigns. That that's This is more classic and I'm picking it because of the composition. Um, yeah, it kind of is. Strange. It's a very strange composition, but I like it. It gets well, a lot of motion, and you kind of just want to turn your head and look at it all over. Yeah, this gives you this sense of of chaos and and very like your world is turning upside down. Nothing is sitting where it's supposed to be. This is what happens when you fiddle with your camera angles, right? So. Straight up and down, it's still good, right? This is this is upright. This is him in in the hordes. But when you do this to it, it's suddenly this tidal wave overwhelming Thor. And the difference is just they they turned it 90 degrees. Tilting the horizon line or somehow changing the the viewer's perspective can have a very strong impact. This is another example of uh, of tilting the horizon. And this is Todd Lockwood. You guys are probably all familiar with him. He's he's the dragon guy. There are some interesting things going on compositionally here. Um, we've clearly created uh, a stable horizon line with sails and everything, and then tilted it so that you have a, a sense of, of motion, a sense of uneasiness. Uh, it, now it feels more tumultuous what is happening with the ocean. But the dragon, this is, this is kind of a, um, an interesting thing. He's decided to crop both wings out uh, in fairly stable places visually. Um, corners are uh, almost too stable. You like don't want to put stuff, usually don't want to put stuff in corners because it no it sits there like a rock. Um, but sometimes you want something to sit like a rock. And what has happened here is both of these things being cropped lock it into the frame. So the dragon feels very stable. He's rock solid. Whereas the ships, not as much. There's something else. The, the ships do not feel like they are, they're not like tipping over or anything like that, but it feels like the dragon is the place to be. Dragon is where it's secure. Dragon is where things are strong. Now, if you rotate it back to where the horizon would be straight, it's a different message, right? Now the dragon is not leading the charge, everybody's following him. Now the dragon is flying off to do his own thing and all of these boats are fine and stable and kind of just, who knows what they're doing. But when Liliana it's tilted. Uh, said, Psst, Liliana. <laughs> Yes, uh, the, that is why I tilted the the view of, of Liliana is uh, to give you that sense of uneasiness. Liliana is painted from the perspective of the victim. You are about to find out whatever Liliana does in her lair, uh, and probably not not the not the good stuff. Yeah, She's not gonna like you at bake you cookies. At Ill ease. You so you that. can see just how dramatically this is um, 
is tilted, right? Here's here's the horizon line. Is it's it's beyond 45 degrees. It's very very tilted, uh, and so the feeling you get is that this mind flayer has has attacked and it is is power. knocking over. It gives it a lot of movement too. Yeah, and as you're looking closer, you you feel like there's there's a struggle, but there's kind of a real. She has a chance. He's he's the attacker. He's the aggressor. But she's she has she has a chance. And if you turn the piece, this part's cool. Drew oh. showed me this when I saw the piece. If you turn the piece, you see it's not that she has a chance. She's winning. And and you, that's when you notice also that it, it's a subtle thing. But she's got the knife. In yeah, him. she's she's uh, she's more the aggressor. If you if you keep it upright like this, I mean it's a mind flare, so. Yeah, but she's winning. <laughs> but yeah, and she's much more uh, confident and capable in this position. You're not worried about her. She has just killed this mind flayer. That's what just happened. However, you go back to the 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 tilt, and the whole scene is very aggressive and very uneasy, and you don't know who's going to win. I mean, this is a great example of the difference is just camera tilt. Uh, so this is Dan Dos Santos and. And that's dandosantos.com, by the way. This segue is lovely from what we were talking about because this is all about camera angle. We are looking straight down on these, these two characters and uh, that gives us a sense of, of kind of hovering above the scene. It adds to that sense of this is a, a quiet moment. And again, he's using a lot of rhythm where, you know, here's where the action is. But all of this stuff, it all radiates to where, where what's happening, right? It's all leading into this, this thing here. Again, he's got light on dark, on light. So there's a lot of these value rhythms as well as shape rhythms that are reinforcing that focal point and the camera angle is creating the narrative. What else do I have? I have Michael Whalen. Can't forget Michael Whalen. Um, everything he does is magic. So Michael Whalen uses a lot of fantastic shape language. By shape language, what I mean is things are generally uh, formed for specific purposes. Uh, when you have vertical things and you have horizontal things, they are strong and they are stable. And you tend to use those for um, iconic uh, or, or religious or anything that is supposed to be strong and stable and unmoving and resolved. You can also use that to contrast something in something else in, in the piece that is not resolved. He has a lot of just great shapes. You know, he's got circles kicking around, he's got squares kicking around, and none of them feel like he's he's trying to be an abstract artist or anything. But this is uh, this is the good stuff you can get out of good abstracted artwork is uh, the shape language he's using. And of course, he's using a lot of um, color contrast here. You've got this really warm area. Um, the the thing that is most strange, most out of place, is way back here, totally faded out into the distance. And so you have a, a strong curiosity and a narrative is happening where, okay, there's a gigantic freaking monster back there, but he's kind of not even part of it somehow because she is so important in the foreground. Uh, this is Keith Parkinson, late and great. What I, what I want to point out here is this is where we start to talk about scale and relationship to the environment. There's not a whole lot of dragon and dude to empty space. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of empty space. And that's what is working. That is the narrative here. Now, if you were to just go on rules, that you would, this wouldn't pass the rules test, right? There's not enough going on. There's too much negative space. There's not enough contrast. There's not 
balance, you know, you should have something up here to balance out him. But no, 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 because this is about something different. This is a lone dragon rider in a boring pedestrian moment out in the middle of nowhere. And so it works. It works really great to not have a bunch of stuff cluttering up the image. It's, it's sized appropriately for that narrative. If you said, for example, okay, well, let's go even further. And he's like tiny way down here. And, uh, and this is all empty wasteland too. That would give you a little bit of a different feeling. What it would suggest to you is more desolation and aloneness. With just the way you frame this, what that says, like if you were closer into him, you'd be like, okay, he's important person. He has a dragon. He's, he's, he's cool. Um, and like, you know, if we pull out like this, he's, he's alone in a vast wasteland. But like if, if you were to, uh, to get up closer, you would start to notice details about him. He would have a story for himself and you would, you would equate him as someone important. If he's this big, he's important. So just plain how big something is, is an important element of composition. Uh -huh. Rule of thirds is a, um, is a compositional framework that says you should start by having your, your piece, whoops, divided into thirds, you know, like a tic-tac-toe board. But your standard composition says, put everything on the third. So here's a face, that's a good place, put him on the third. We'll put um, the background horizon line over here, and then we'll put a moon in the sky. And then, uh, you know, we'll sort of fill in some stuff. He's got a mountain range behind him and, and stuff like that. And that works, that will always work. So you can, you can definitely use the rule of thirds. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out with a couple of these pieces was, um, that's not a rule. It's a tool. It's a, it's a starting point. And for a lot of compositions, it does very well. However, don't feel like you have to. This is another Keith Parkinson. And it's another, it's an example of a few of the things we already talked about. One is, um, when we talk about Donato's sketch, inviting the viewer in, uh, you can kind of follow this dragon all the way to this little dragon guy. And uh, a lot of radial stuff pulling you in. Keith did a lot of this. Everything kind of points rawr, to dragon face. Uh, that I decided has to a, show. A question. He noticed that a lot of magic artists' art is actually bigger than the four thirds, uh, four to three ratio. Uh -huh. Could you say how Watsi directs and decides how to crop the piece? What I usually do is, is I send them a piece cropped as is. Um, I occasionally will have a piece that I'll send them a version that is cropped to fit in the frame, but. Um, Usually that's the art, in my experience, um, it's the artist making that decision, not the, uh, not the art well, director or the graphic design you staff. To, you send them a sketch, they say, I like it, but zoom in. Oh, yes, yes. That, that definitely, that, that's past the sketch stage. Um, but for finals, I, I, it's usually up to the artist. When you are designing for cards, you do have to think differently. What works on a card is not necessarily going to work like a book cover or uh, anything else because it's so small when it's done that if you were to say, oh, I like that, I like that Keith Parkinson idea of a little guy here with his dragon, he's sitting on his dragon. When that's a card, it's just, it's just the dot and a bunch of mountains. Um, a lot of times when Steve's drawing, he'll actually keep a thumbnail up. In, um, I mean, you have that thumbnail in, that you can have in um, Photoshop, but it'll actually have it on a separate screen so he can see overall how it's looking in that, that size. Yeah, I, I will do a lot of work uh, actually over here in the navigator because it's about the size of a card, a card window. And so if I can't tell what I'm seeing 
in that navigator, then I need to rework it. They do tell us uh, if it's gonna be a different size, uh, like a Planeswalker card. And that's also something that takes a little bit of a, a different approach because you know that mostly, mostly people are gonna see that. So you're still mostly composing for that, but you also know that for the marketing art, they want the whole thing. So um, while, while you guys are getting your stuff turned in, uh, how to compose a piece. Uh, <laughs> At the end. That, that might be a bit much, but we'll just do a, a quick little um, stuff to think about. First off is don't even worry about details. Um, in fact, in a lot of ways, you don't even have to worry about what the stuff is. <laughs> You're just gonna be like, okay, well, let's let's do a, a dog. Okay, so let's do let's do a dog. Oh, a dog is a good way to do it because you can have different definitions. Is it Cujo? Is it your best friend? The quick one is uh, if he's if he's sad and alone, you make him small, put him kind of facing away from all the stuff in the world that's happening. You got crowds of people and he's kind of around a corner somewhere all by his lonesome, something like that. And uh, this would be something where scale makes makes the difference. He He's small in the frame. Uh, or if the story is about a a happy dog he could be jumping on his owner. I'm happy. And they're both really big in frame and he's got a giant tongue licking him. I don't know. Cujo would be an example of using a camera angle and the perspective of the viewer. So a scary Cujo would be uh, pause, angry, frothing, angry, super crazy. Like he's got you pinned and you even have like you show the gravity of it that you're actually on the ground by like dribbling, hanging globules of spit and stuff as he growls at you. These are terrible, terrible sketches, but that's the idea is you just want to explore some ideas. Um, some other things to think about as you're composing scenes is uh, how things overlap. When you overlap characters, for example, they they have a relationship by that overlap. Um, whether they're standing close together, and they're both happy, mm -hmm. you've you've made a connection, they're friends, or they're overlapping because they're they're facing off against each other. Uh, and this one has a fly swatter. It's important to overlap elements because it creates relationships and it creates depth. What you want to do as, as, uh, as an artist or a graphic designer or, or anything you want to do um, that needs composition is keep in mind all of these various tools, ideas, concepts that you can try. But if this were your book cover and you had this guy kind of cropped, that would suggest a, a variety of things. More naughty, like what 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 that devil is doing with that spork. Yeah, maybe. Uh. <laughs> um, it also starts to create a narrative of, oh hey, that th this guy has a relationship with both of them. Maybe these are in his head. Maybe he's struggling with his inner demons in a goofy spork and spatula way. Uh, but it also is the crop. If he were if he were just sort of standing in front. Like, eh, I don't know what's going on. It would it would be a different story. See, now this guy has a relationship with the book because he's eating it. <laughs> all right, um, does that mean all... if you're starting a job <laughs> like that, you need me to send you the people's squam work and J-doodles? Yep. All right, this one's Scott's. Baby's first bottle. Baby's first bottle, full of tentacles. That's awesome. Thundercats. Lion-o. Great minds think alike. Sort of yes, they do. 
And see, if you notice, this one is kind of more of a movie poster sort of design. Mm-hmm. I like the uh, the space and the uh, and the moon. And we have some uh, Story st like storytelling, uh, storyboard kind of yeah, thing here. Yeah, those are the ones I was telling you about. This is what was Skeletor. so cool because we have the movie poster style with Dan, and then with um, the other ones, it's more of the um, storyboards like we were talking about. And this one's Bakari's. Great use of the lighting. Yeah. Uh, this is very narrative. This is a great um, beat by beat composition. The Eye of of Lionel and the Eye of Pandora. And see, this is what I was talking about. The first three we got turned in for the J Doodle is one was the the back and the movie poster, one was the composition, uh, the the storyboards, and then this one's super close up. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool to see all the different types of composition we got from the people. I think they understood the homework. Yeah, yeah I great. think so too. You guys, you guys rose to the occasion. That last one was M Dizzy. This next one is Jamek. I believe it is a Rubik's Cube of a, uh, of Cthulian size. Rubik's Cube destroying San Francisco. Yes, I liked it a lot. <laughs> That's awesome. It rises from the depths. The epic scale. Very nice, very nice. A... Dan. <laughs> a Cthulhu bear. Yes, that, uh, that's that's his, first, his first toy was a, a bear, his teddy bear. So that's that's frightening. Whoa, is this Cthulhu with a baby, or is it Cthulhu's Cthulhu as a baby with his first toy? This is Morgan Horatius. Because this um, looks like two I living think this things. This is adorable. It, I this is my own interpretation, and that's because I'm a nerd. I think it looks like Cthulhu with a beholder toy. <laughs> Which kinda, would be it the does. coolest thing, because Cthulhu is a total and he's, and like, the, gamer nerd. And it, it's like the beholder's crying, it's terrified, because Cthulhu, I mean, he's, he's kind of scary. But Cthulhu loves his toy. Oh, that's great. This one's Seth. It's a trap. <laughs> Box of horror. Oh, Ra uh, Rossius said that the it's not a beholder, it's a mini Azathoth. Oh, okay, that makes adorable. sense. Yeah, that's... That is cool. A toy trap box. Is it? Uh, is it like a mimic? Like a? It totally looks like a mimic. Yeah. Box. I like that. That's fantastic. Got the arms out the side. You know you want this Han Solo action figure. <laughs> <laughs> Reach inside me. We will play. We'll have such fun together. And I the next then. One chance. Clean Surface Finder 3000. <laughs> so this is this is me. As a child. <laughs> <laughs> that is your crayon with its sight. It's clean surface jump <laughs> finder 3000. That's awesome. <laughs> the next one up is Asteroxo. And so this one is the matchbox car, the Cthulian matchbox cars. <laughs> I love the tentacle for wheels. <laughs> that's, that's very clever, very inventive. Yeah, this is Asteroxo. Brings new meaning to the term just crawling along. And then the last the monster one face. is Controller Freaks. Which this is the one we were having a big debate about. And, <laughs> and Controller Freak is now apologizing in the chat. Don't apologize. This, this is appropriately disturbing. Yeah, and it's like adorable and yet terrible. And I don't know. But the, the Furby, there was much discussion about how we weren't going to sleep well. Well, and we were talking about composition and I know that this was part of the J Doodle and not the composition homework, but this has pretty strong composition. You have this lovely little light shaft that brings you right to those deadly eyes, but it also is your only form of escape. As the viewer, whatever it, the way out, the way to the light, you have to go through this guy. And this guy has just eaten something with blood in it, or. Well, it's a shadow. <laughs> I guess I guess it is a shadow. The red makes it. I know it's a little bit of a glow, but it 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 suggests at least uh, that the substance is also red. Uh, yes. Yes. And so you it feel like it, not, it, it definitely adds to the creepy. It's it's yeah. It's very. It's adorable and creepy at the same time. Good work on that. That's kudos there. We'll tell them what the squam, squam work is. Squam work bonus round. All right. Super villain day jobs. Super villain day jobs, because not every super villain is 
getting the, getting paid. They have to work their way up just like everybody else and maybe maybe they've fallen on hard times. They've been thwarted by Spider-Man or whoever, enough bank robberies that they have to take day job to support all of their henchmen and stuff. And Asteroxo asked what the lesson was. Well, actually, he had a suggestion for it. It's the same one I said. Oh, well, then perspective. let's... Perspective. Study equals perspective. And you can interpret that however you like. That can be a uh, perspective as in you you do all of your um, visual perspective where everything's lining up and and drawn in perspective. Or maybe it's uh, the villain is gaining his own perspective on what it is to be a working man. I don't know. <laughs> um, thanks so much for hanging out with us. And our random winner is number three. I swear this random number generator is not so random because it's always like the first five. I don't know. But uh, I, well, but luckily the order people submit things to us in is random. Except, well, yeah, even like homework and everything is kind of random. So that is M Dizzy. M Dizzy wins. Congrats, M Dizzy. All right, well, we're going to sign off for the night then. All right. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah,